Nonprofits. I'm your host, Dennis Lubay, along with Matt Dillahunty, Hello. Russell Glasser, Beth Presswood, <laughs> and we're coming to you live magically on the 16th of April, 2011, from the Dillahunty International Studios in the Mystic Oak Tree in Austin, Texas. The music you heard was Peter Cottontail, and it will chase all the goblins away. This show was sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization run by mighty wizards for the promotion of positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can learn more by clicking your heels together three times and calling their voicemail at 512-371-2911 or closing your eyes and clapping your hands and visiting their website at www.atheist-community.org. The nonprofit is brought to you by Magical Fairies every Saturday from 2 to 3 o'clock Central Time. To participate in the show, you only have to rub the lamp and make a wish and follow the directions found at www.nonprofitsradio.com to join their mystical chat room circle. So sit back, trust everything we tell you, and you too can be a mighty wizard with magical powers and wealth undreamed of. Just send us your credit card number. It's true. I tried the program and it works. Tell us more about this amazing <laughs> wizard power. Advertised results are not indicative of all respondents. Yes. Please do not send us your credit card numbers. Yeah. Um, far too ethical to be the rich uh, evangelist for atheism. But uh, So, yeah, uh, we were trying to think of music to actually use today. And, of course, next Sunday... Uh -huh. is Easter, that wonderful pagan fertility festival that has been co-opted by a zombie religious cult. Um, Where they force rabbits to lay eggs. It's it, awful. It's terrible. And then they paint them and hide them and roll them around and make kids try and find them. Uh, and it's just... Think of the fetuses. It's just Wait, horrible. people do that? What does that have to do with chocolate? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> That's a good point. I, I just know this is chocolate week. It's all this is chocolate, chocolate holiday. The other thing that's happening this coming weekend, in addition to Easter, and not by coincidence, is the American Atheist National Convention in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, uh. And we've already talked about it and read the list of speakers. And what I'd like to mention uh, quickly is stuff that Dave Silverman told me about, which is that the registration registration is currently closed. They have room for about 850 or so. They're closing in on 700. So they, they have drawn a line, and they'll be uh, selling day passes at the door. So if you're not already registered, there's still space available, but they're not taking registrations online anymore. You just need to kind of show up. And pay, I think it's like seventy nine dollars for a day or one seventy nine for the weekend type thing. And hey, you know, if you're trying to figure out what day you really need to go, um, I'm speaking on Sunday, so All you know, right. you should probably buy tickets for Saturday when the important people will be talking. <laughs> uh, Christopher Hitchens was, of course, supposed to be the headliner there. Um, I know that he's. Of course, ill and seeking yes. treatment. Um, the next word that I got was that he was going to be there via Skype. Um, I'm now hearing that um, there's going to be a letter uh, sent along from him. So clearly, he's not doing particularly well. Uh, oh dear. And you know, our our thoughts are clearly be with him, um, and we wish him all the best. And we also understand that wishing him the best is completely useless yes. but a kind gesture we're nonetheless. frustrated that our best intents are, are worth yeah. nothing really yeah. at this point 
So, um, I'm actually getting there Thursday afternoon and doing going to the speaker's dinner Thursday. Um, I'll be around for pretty much the whole thing. Still have no idea. Well, I know I have an idea of what I'm talking about, but I have not finished uh, with my presentation. So, I'll be uh, scrambling on that this week, um, for mostly for a bit of, of kind of fun. But it'll probably get preachy because that's me. What's everybody else doing? I'm um, starting a new job on Monday. Whoa. I saw that post. Cool. Congratulations. I uh, tend not to tell people that when I'm out of work because it's embarrassing. <laughs> but but then when I have a job again, I let you know that I haven't been working for over a month. Uh, I had no idea. I yeah. thought you were transitioning directly from one job to another. And all our millionaire <laughs> listeners are going, oh, ah, I could have hired him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess next time I should try putting the call out. But when I try it on Facebook and I say Java Enterprise Programmer looking for work, people just go, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> they zone out at Java. Yeah. Uh, well, you know. But it is going to be my first full-time with benefits job in Ooh. like 10 years. Sweet. So. I'm Outstanding. pleased about that. Congratulations. Are Thanks. you are you doing any like I know, I know you were playing around with Android development on your own. Are you doing uh, any no, of that? With I the mean, job? I, I during the interview I showed off the program I was working on and said, "Oh yeah, I learned I got my Android a month ago and this is what I'm doing now." And I think that helped. So <laughs> it, huh, I, I cool. went to I went to a thing in uh downtown where where it's mandatory for some people who are collecting unemployment which i didn't get around to to go to these classes that teach you how to interview and just about everything the guy said i thought was wrong which was basically keep your head down say what you think the company wants to hear don't say anything controversial uh, uh hmm. and i thought if I were to go into a programming interview like that, they would think this guy doesn't have an original thought in his head, and I'm going to have to micromanage the hell out of him. <laughs> and your people skills are clearly lacking if you're sitting there with your head down, just, <laughs> yes, sir, I want this to make this the best company it can be, and I'm right, really yes, looking so forward I to the opportunity. their mission statement Man. Yeah, to them. I mean, on the other hand, are a that's not an interview, off. that's supplication. I mean, God. On the other hand, you know, if we're choosing whether to take advice from somebody whose only job is to tell other people how to get jobs, <laughs> yeah. or somebody who just admitted that in 10 years they haven't had a full time job with benefits, I think I'm going to a third Wait party. A <laughs> uh, and, and on that front, I'm uh, new to the whole Android scene as well. I finally have an Uber phone, um, which I've had a love-hate relationship cool. with um, no, i just have a love relationship with mine <laughs> well it turned out i originally got uh the evo and we were on sprint and our, our house is in a dead zone for sprint so we took them back and now i've got a thunderbolt and i'm on verizon but verizon hasn't rolled out mm-hmm. their 4g in austin um and so i don't know it, it's all about battery lives and rooting and other stuff and oh wait well it's certainly colorful i yeah. love my fascinate I love getting Facebook all the time on my phone. I love Angry Birds. I'm just in love with my phone. For those of you just tuning in, you're listening to the Tech Talk Hour. Yeah. <laughs> I have an iPhone, you heathens. <laughs> Infidel! <laughs> Get the hence. The irony. Well, I won't go into the whole <clears throat> Mac thing or whatever. Uh <laughs> So yeah, we've we've completely blown the first few minutes by talking yeah, about our phones, phones and other yeah. stuff that nobody cares about. That's right. I will say though our, that if you're in the market, awful little secret: we're my, all nerds. My I'm phone sorry to disillusion you. My phone does not believe in God. Neither does mine. Um, Outstanding. I haven't asked mine. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're relevant now. But it also doesn't not believe. Oh wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is a passive atheist. That's all atheist. it takes. Yes, yes, it's a weak atheist, definitely. Well, I needed I needed something that was actually going to be useful to me, especially with the amount of traveling that I've you know got uh-huh. scheduled and wedding plans and other stuff. So, so hey, uh, this is like a show with a bunch <laughs> of atheists, and so let's talk about stuff relevant to that. Who's got a news item to start with? Well, I have a god, but it doesn't use AT and T, so I suppose. Oh wait, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'd like to. Go ahead and start with this Ferengula post about what's happening in Tennessee. 
where uh, Tennessee legislators are debating the addition of creationism to their science curriculum, and apparently they've run out of reasonable excuses, so Reed Dumlikin, <laughs> aha, PZ, uh, Frank nicely dragged in the corpse of Albert Einstein, stuck his hand up his bony thorax, and rattled his jawbone to make a speech. Yep. <laughs> I think that if there's one thing that everyone in this room would agree on, that would be that Albert Einstein was a critical thinker. He was a scientist. I think that we could probably agree that Albert Einstein was smarter than any science teachers in our high schools or colleges. And Albert Einstein said that a little knowledge would turn your head toward atheism, while a broader knowledge would turn your head toward Christianity. Uh, uh, I have a problem with that. <laughs> Which is? Uh, Einstein I think didn't he's say that. A Jew. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> even though there's that quote that I mean, Ray Comfort has Einstein as his icon, which I think is incredibly arrogant. No, I just think it's absolutely <laughs> hilarious. Yes. I mean, you might as well as attribute it to Gandhi. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I like your Christ, but not your Christians. <laughs> yeah, right. but yes, Einstein, to the extent that he was religious at all, was a Jew, and also. I noticed something else that this legislator said. When, the thing in this quote that first caught my eye was when he said, he was a scientist, and I think he, we could agree that Albert Einstein was smarter than any of our science teachers in our high schools or college. I can't agree with that. How no. the fuck do you know? First of all, smarter is one of those nebulous yeah. weasel terms. Yeah, there are a lot of axes. Um, you know, was his IQ higher? Was he more creative? Was he more intuitive? Was he more, you know? Did he do better in first grade math? Yeah. Um, yeah, if he was such a genius, why was he a frickin', what was he, a... a patent a, clerk? Patent clerk, yeah. I mean, it was, it was so he could steal other people's ideas on... <laughs> oh, no, that's it. No. You know, but it, it's this general pattern that I notice when creationists are talking a lot, where they tend to, like exaggerate the importance of any one person that they happen to be quoting. Oh, so, yeah. So, like, I used to listen to D. James Kennedy before he, he thankfully died. <laughs> and he, he would, uh, whenever he was making an argument from authority, you could tell because he was saying, so-and-so was the best whatever he was in the uh -huh. world. <laughs> um, Great. And... and I mean, I like and respect what Einstein did and think he's a good role model, but I would never say um, anything so fawning about him or Richard Dawkins or anyone like that. Yeah, and, and I've actually been asked bluntly before when they bring up the Einstein. Or no, actually, it wasn't Einstein. and It was um, um, Newton. Uh, somebody, you know, when I was pointing out that, sure, Newton... Brilliant scientist, innovator, cool, mm -hmm. and also, you know, not very bright when it came yeah. to matters of theology. Incredible religious I flake. I don't <laughs> completely. No, he wasn't bright. He was just wrong. No, he bought into some things that <laughs> yeah, hook, land, sink. Were were pretty, you know, I mean, he had a he had a fondness for you know alchemy and and things like that, and and looking right. for the mysticism. And I don't fault him for that because that was. Um, you know, kind of the thinking of the time. Yeah, the science of the day. So somebody asked me point blank, well, do you think you're smarter than Isaac Newton? And I said, on that subject, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm certainly better informed. I'm more knowledgeable <laughs> than Isaac Newton. I have the benefit right. of 400 years of those giants that he was yeah, talking about. Right, absolutely. Him included. A lot of people have stood on his shoulders since he yep. was around. Thank you, yep. Isaac. Woo. Good job. Uh, now, do I think I'm, you know, more intelligent or creative or inventive? No, I, but I don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But when you start saying that, I think we can all agree that Einstein was smarter than all of the science teachers in, in colleges and high schools today. Uh, no, we can't all agree on that. Anyway, it wasn't, it, Einstein didn't say that, did he? No. No. No, of course no, not. Of course not. Not even uh, close. As a matter of fact. Uh, do I, they know who? <laughs> yes, they do, and uh, even the person who said that didn't actually say that. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> of course, classic for it, Christian it, quote well, mining. I mean, it's another case of a co Fuckers. of a quote uh, of a quote mine where it didn't quite sound good enough, and so they right. tweaked it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, give me a 
Give me you some. Can, you do can find it. Else while I hunt sure. It down. People are filth. So it's, oh wait, I found it. Okay. Francis Bacon. Ah, okay. Francis Bacon said, "A little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's mind around about to religion." But it doesn't say Christianity. Oh, yeah. Wow. They so, really massaged that so one. So he got the wrong person. Well, first and of all, then he got the wrong quote. The original quote had to do with an assessment of philosophy and not necessarily yeah. knowledge, so they changed that. Yes. And then it was religion, and they changed it to Christianity. And then they changed Francis Bacon to Albert Einstein. Uh, okay. Typical. And the thing <laughs> is, they don't care. I mean, no, I, I wouldn't shit. accuse this one legislator of having personally been aware of the original quote and tinkered around with it to suit his needs. Now, what if he uses it, he's responsible for it. People, I say, fuck him. But people tra- people pass these quotes along, and they make, like, one tiny change each way. I mean, it's a game of telephone. But the real distinction with these type of conservative religious legislators is they, don't, they aren't in the habit of sourcing stuff. No, yeah. they never question anything, apparently. And they don't care. Hey, here's somebody yeah, who, is, who is really smart, and you've just offered me what is supposed to be a quote from them that agrees with what I already believe. Serves my purposes. So I'm going to run with it. I'm there. I mean, clearly, he thinks he's as smart as Einstein, um, mm-hmm. while demonstrating that he's, he's dumb not. As a stick. Right. Uh, and speaking of sourcing stuff, which we do here, um, thinkprogress.org, which is a liberal site, but it has a video of the guy saying, "Ah, okay." It. So, <laughs> good. you know, unless they're really good at forgery. Yeah. Man. <clears throat> well, it's like what the 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 uh, Darwin. Quote where he's talking oh, yeah. about the, the development eye. of the eye, yeah, <laughs> and he he he, he starts the rhetorical uh, uh, sequence w- with you know it to seems that, that eye... it would be impossible for it to develop with you know uh, yeah. without intelligent guidance. I agree, but and then, I'm running with that. That's right. But then the rest of the paragraph is all about. But here's how it evolves through natural processes. I love yeah, it when like, people uh... call in with that quote. Because God. what I always say is, well, go on, read the rest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean the rest? That's where my quote ends. I found it on, you know, talk or creationism dot com or whatever. Yep. What do you mean the rest? Oh. Yeah. So yeah, this is this is pretty typical. Um, mm-hmm. and the the thing that I find kind of. I mean, okay, so you've got a quote that's been misquoted and then missourced and then misrepresented um, as <laughs> as an appeal to a, an authority that would still be a fallacious appeal to authority because Einstein has no recognized mm-hmm. expertise in matters of religion. Right. And then it's put out forth as part of a political statement in a country that is supposed to be secular. Secular. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> How many ways can this be questionable? <laughs> I d- uh, just plus, uh, plus wow. even if that was an Albert Einstein quote, it's not an argument. I mean, the quote, it, even if it had been used correctly, is just basically saying if you're not a Christian, then you're dumb. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing. It's like those jokes where the joke can really you can plug in a group you like and a group you hate at the end, like. Uh, like, uh, you know, these are atheist kittens. What? Yesterday they were atheist kittens, but today they're Christians because their eyes are open. You can flip it around. You can make it Democrat and Republican. You can make it Big Indian right. and Little Indian Lilliput. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, the one of the, the classics of that from the my time in the military is, uh, and it's, of course, a gender bias, but there's a... Uh, a sailor and a marine are in the head at the urinal, uh, and the marine gets done and goes over and washes his hands, and the sailor just starts marching out the door, and the marine looks at the sailor and says, you know, in the Marine Corps, they teach us to wash our hands after we piss. And the sailor says, yeah, in the Navy, they teach us not to piss on our hands. <laughs> yep. But, so. Yes. Classic. And you could Classic. just as easily reverse the roles. In Absolutely. Yeah. That's- yeah. And ha- And have. I've heard it. And seen it written in any number of ways. And but. if you're willing to make up quotes by Albert Einstein, then of course you can you can stick in any groups you want there. Yep. Sure. Like David Barton. <laughs> 
Uh, I just love it. Anyway, at ironchariots.wiki.ironchariots.org, the wiki that I desperately need to find time to update all of the software <laughs> on and take care of the forums and stuff, and I apologize. Um, I'd love to actually turn it over to somebody with time who you know I would trust as an admin, but I haven't found the right person or the time to actually do it. You'll find a page there about Einstein with sourced quotes. Um, <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that uh, I didn't get to talk to Ray about this when he called in. He includes some Einstein quotes, um, some of which are accurate, mm -hmm. that portray a particular image of his view on religion. Right. And I, I have quotes on Iron Chariots that are accurate that portray a different view of his well, what he has to say about religion and this is an error that comes up all the time and i like mentioning this because i'm a prime example there are things that einstein said at different points in his life yes. that reflect different views mm -hmm. views change it is it is incorrect to sum up a man's lifetime where their views change and progress and mature and use their earliest statements as if they're indicative. I think it's better to use their later statements with some exceptions. Yeah. But it's it's best to say that, look, this person's views don't really always consistently reflect what you think they do. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get in the situation of, well, you know, Anthony Flew changed I his mind. That. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's uh, the thing that's okay, to mind. Obviously, we have extenuating circumstances there, which, by the way, um, he already acknowledged prior to his death. But you could go back and find quotes from me um, advocating that Jesus is Lord. Clearly, mm -hmm. you can find other quotes that would advocate the opposite. Um, I'll be happy to give them to you at any point. So, in other words, you're just really deep cover right now, right? Yeah. And now, when I'm 80, um, assuming you know somebody doesn't kill me before then, or I don't die of something silly, um, there's I'm not going to rule out the possibility that I won't lose my mind and and adhere to some religion, and I won't also rule out the possibility that I become convinced. I don't see that that's yeah. likely, and I, I currently have no reason to think that's even remotely plausible. Um, but, you know, in the everything's possible category, there it is. Now, what's, when people look back on my life, what's going to be the assessment of my opinion? I hope the assessment is, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> Anybody who says, well, Matt Dillahoney said, you know, blah, blah. Stop. <laughs> It's take <laughs> take the arguments and the evidence as the merits, not the individual who speaks That's them, right. because it doesn't matter. And and I find it particularly ironic that Christians in particular are fond of reaching out for Einstein and stuff. When you would think all the it, Einstein was the smartest scientist who ever lived, and he said this. Well, you would think that if your beliefs were true and you were comfortable in them, that you should just be able to say, Jesus is God, and he said this. Right. And that's as far as you'd ever yeah, need to go. Yeah, you don't need to go there. And, and what the heck? Why are they going to Einstein? Don't these kind of people think that uh, intelligent people are all, ooh, you know, uh, too elitist for us? You know, well, they, and, I mean, until they agree with grief. them. Yeah, until they agree with them. Yeah, I mean, the, very, the reason that they don't like uh, – or – the reason that they don't quote smart people or more generally is yeah. because most of them think they're wrong. That's right. And, the, and so smart reason, people don't usually agree with them. The reason they highlight <laughs> the especially smart people who do happen to agree with them or are wrongly oh, quoted as agreeing, yes, as agreeing with them is because it's so God. unusual. Yeah. Hey, man. We couldn't find any other living scientists who would get up here and, you know, with any... Now I'm 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 curious. Reputation. How much quote mining do we find in the atheist community? Ooh, I wouldn't say that that it doesn't happen. It doesn't exist at all. No. No, no, I'm saying I would not say that that Right, right. That's, that's, that's Um I think that you're going to find quote mining anywhere and you're going to find uh errors. Mhm. Mm um almost any time somebody's advocating a position because I am human, 
And as skeptical as I am and as rigorous as I am in critical thinking, there are occasions where someone, for example, Beth, has earned my trust, and I consider them a reliable source. So when she tells me something, unless it's just outrageous, I'm probably going to accept tentatively that she's telling me something correct. And I've done this before, where I've relied on something somebody said or a news Mm -hmm. story, and then we go back later and find out, no, 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 that was a parody. You remember just a few weeks ago, I... I was caught right in the middle of a show loudly reading something that was infuriating me, and it turned out to be a joke right there in the show. Yeah, wasn't it some uh, political statement? Yeah, from... something like that. And it, and it was like, it sounds yes. plausible, yeah. but, yeah. Then, but then we can't do that. The second you think you're immune from uh-huh. being duped You'll step is, into it. is when you're going to be more, most likely to be duped. Yeah, when I... Uh, was it that Ferengula story about the... Uh, Except when you're not. The, uh, oh God, what was it? Um, the bar trying to... Uh, uh, the bar that burned down from the lightning strike and the Baptist church said, Ah, no, our God that. just... Oh. <laughs> I read that one and I went, Oh, what a great story. And <laughs> then I read the, the comments and somebody said, You know, uh, check... Uh, Snopes and all that yeah. stuff. And I, oh no, and I didn't. Yeah, I was all posed. So but was, where, whereas our reaction is, oh, I feel so stupid for having done that. Christians will often double down when they when they yeah. find out about that. They'll say like, yeah. You know, let me let me give you an example that I oh, mentioned once do. once before. While you guys dig up the next news bit, um, we we've. We've all fallen prey to something. You know, Snopes is a, a great resource and everything else. Yeah. Um, but what Russell's By the talking way, about. Snopes has actually planted a few stories that are especially ridiculous. And uh, they say they're true when they're not because they have a, they have a page that, that that links to saying, did we fool you there? Because you shouldn't trust us either. Either, right. You should check out the source. Authority. So they have some deliberate plants question authority anyway go on well i i was not aware of that and no i'm not citing snopes as the definitive authority on anything um but when russell's talking about how christians in particular seem to double down on this um during the run-up to uh obama's election as president um i received email from a friend of mine actually his wife basically um Quoting Obama as saying that he was going to, I don't know, change the national anthem and the national song and all this. I mean, just absolutely ridiculous stuff. And it turned out, um, you know, when I read it, I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I'm shocked. So I went and looked. And, of course, it was on Snopes and it was on several other sites. There was a guy who had written this as a parody of, right. you know, and who knows if it was because uh, of racist accusations of, you know, we're putting the first black man in the white house or just general you know conservative liberal conflict but so i sent out a response um she had emailed of course everybody on her email list i sent out a response with links to the source that showed that this was debunked and the response i got back was no i heard him say this (sighs) okay this is the problem with when you Crazy latch onto something up people. where your personal beliefs and your personal memories and perceptions of reality trump whatever evidence somebody can give you. You have lost. And <clears throat> I wrote back and was like, okay, I just sent you the citation of the guy who actually made this up. Okay, and you're saying you heard him say it. Where did you hear him say it? Can you all, can you cite some source, you know, or whatever? It turned into a huge blow up um, that was unnecessary, and turned into a little pissing match over stuff. Mm-hmm. But this type of thing <clears throat> happens, and Someone people was have wrong on the internet. <sighs> yeah, usually I just sick Beth on him at that point. But uh, <laughs> people have, have talked about, for example. When uh, when Ray Comfort called into the show, and 
well, why didn't you hit this and this and this and this and this? Well, first of all, you can't. They, they, the apologists can spew more information in a minute than you can debunk in an hour, or yeah. properly debunk in an hour. But second of all, they were complaining, well, there was a lot of interruption. And I, I realize that in this room, that happens a lot. We've, yeah. we've tried different things. We've tried raising hands. Um, you've got you know, strong personalities that all have something to interject, and we just kind of go with it. And I'm mostly fine with it. But they were like, no, 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 you guys, you know, you interrupted uh, Ray. Um, let me be clear. I'm open to criticism like that, and we have done it too much in the past. Um, but I think that that's entirely invalid on that front in this particular instance. And it's because of the nature of the show, the time limit, and the nature of who I'm actually having a conversation with. What I've found in the years that I've been doing this show is that if you let them continue, they never shut up. Once they've started an argument based on a flawed uh, premise, right. when you yeah. when you when they stop and you say, "Okay, let's go back to the beginning," where you said, "I can survive in outer space without any you uh-huh. know external assistance, just naked," um, I I, re, I, re, I reject that. Um, and here's the problem with that: the answers that you get back are, "I didn't say that." You're misrepresenting mm-hmm. what I'm saying. You misunderstood what I said. Or on some occasions, okay, yes, but, and then a rephrasing of the exact same thing, oh. and then five more minutes of them going right. down another path. Okay? So the easiest solution, and I don't care if people perceive it as rude, um, the easiest solution is to interrupt at the point where there's a, a, a disagreement, a point of contention, and say, okay, we need to stop here and, and clarify this or re- define this or something along those lines because otherwise you're going to be building up to a big point when you've started out with something as absurd as I can live in outer space, you know, right, with no food or protection. Right. This is actually an important point in basic logic. Uh, in fact, there's a famous story about Bertrand Russell who – we know a lot as an atheist and the guy I was named after, but um, he was first and foremost a mathematician. And um, when he went in front of a crowd once and was lecturing and explained that if you start with a false premise, you can prove any conclusion. And right. one of the guys in the audience looked shocked and said, what, you're saying that if I tell you two plus two is five, then you can prove that you're the pope? Bertrand Russell says, sure. And then on the spot, he ad-libbed, wow. 2 plus 2 is 5, therefore 4 equals 5, subtract four from bo- or 3 from both sides, 1 equals 2, the Pope and I are two people, <laughs> 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 but 2 equals 1, so the Pope and I are one person, therefore I am the Pope. <laughs> the, di- <laughs> the difference in a theistic conversation would be that instead of everybody just laughing in the conversation ending, the theist would say, now that we've both agreed that I'm a pope, let's go on, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll prove some other stuff. Yeah. And so that's that's the reason why I, I and granted, I'm no, I'm no fan of, oh, no, 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 you said something wrong, so let's hammer it. It's a, it's a way of making sure that we don't waste precious time on the show yeah. on something. Every time um, about the same thing. And so, you know, when you when you start an argument with a premise that's re- reje- instantly rejected or flawed or whatever else, um, sometimes it's worth letting them get the whole argument out. Other times it's not. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is the prevalence of people who simply don't understand logical fallacies, logical arguments. If I uh, allow an apologist to make a flawed argument, he gets all his points out right up to the conclusion, and then we go back to the thing that's wrong. If we're unable to come to some agreement that it's wrong, or if they respin that in a way, or claim that I'm misrepresenting him or whatever else, mm-hmm. then their entire argument's going to stand for those people who. Right. Good point. If I go back and let's. You know, let's say interrupt them right then. Yeah. If your first premise is the Bible is the word of God and literally true. Therefore, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What, by what right do you make that claim? Let's right. let's talk about this for a second because this is a foundational point of disagreement. Yeah, this is a big premise. You need now, to establish it, and it's not easy. I, I just I f- finished watching finally the right. debate between uh, Sam Harris and William Lane Craig at Notre Dame that happened on I think the ninth. Yeah. Um, and there were people who posted videos of it and even posted them up to my Facebook, um, where. 
William Lane Craig had had offered his two contentions and then said, you'll notice that those are conditionals and I will not be arguing for or against the existence of God because it has no bearing on them. And the person who heard him say that and made this video was like, what? That, that's absurd. And it's because they didn't quite see the details there. Craig was absolutely right. Um, uh, and, and, and by the way, not realizing that he was right and why he was right, um, offered up this red herring that allowed Craig's more subtle point to get through. And I'll tell you what the subtle point was, just for the people who haven't watched it yet. His two contentions are, essentially, if there is a God, then objective morality is possible. And if there's not a God, objective morality is not possible. Now, here's the thing. The first half of each of those contentions combined make a true dichotomy. Either there is a God or there's not a God. Those are, in fact, the only two options. The second half of those two contentions make a true dichotomy. Either there is objective morality or there's not objective morality. However, when you combine them into two statements that are a union there, it gives the impression that you have stated simply two true dichotomies. Either there is a God and more objective morality is possible, or there's not a God and objective morality is not possible. Uh -huh. That is not, in fact, a true dichotomy. It is, uh, it is a rhetorical kind of trick, uh, a way of phrasing right. things. Now, you need to do your two-by-two two grid. Actually, the logical opposite of there is a God and there is objective morality is there is no God or there is no objective morality. Right. The, the thing is, Craig wasn't being dishonest here. He understood that he had to defend his two contentions, and he went on to attempt to do that. But by stating it that way, you give the impression to the unaware and the people who already agree with you, by the way, that you've already made your case before you made it. Look, those are the only two possibilities and so you've given the impression that you've made your case before you've actually made it. And now everything that he says, for the people who already agree with him, is a bunch of head nodding things. For the people who are in the middle are a bunch of, uh, oh, okay, you know, he's making his, his case, but, you know, I see that that's a dichotomy. And then there's a handful, or, or however many, maybe most, who knows, hopefully, I hope someday it's most, who are sitting there going, you know, no, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Um, <laughs> And, you know, Sam Harris took some heat for not <clears throat> responding. I mean, Craig was there to do a debate, and Harris was right to call him out on his blog of, of doing this as a high school debate. Because Craig would get up there and say, you'll notice that Dr. Harris didn't respond to this and this, and such and such, and blah, 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 and there you go. And so I'm happy to deal with those things in another debate, but today's debate is about this subject, right down to him rephrasing what the debate is mm -hmm. at the beginning. Um Harris did what he meant to do, and um, I think it kind of worked. Um, you know, I think he did what a lot of more people should try doing, which is he pretty much went there and stated his case. And the two of them essentially talked past each other most right. of the night. Huh. Harris made his case. Craig made his Harris then went up and made his case again. Craig went up and made his case again and pointed out how Harris hadn't addressed this. Uh, meanwhile, Harris is pointing out that Craig has misrepresented what Harris has said, et cetera. Um, so it's one of the big problems with debates, and it's, and it's specifically with that format where I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk. There's no interaction no between the two. No so basically it's a joint press conference. Oh, and in a, joint right. in a joint press conference, I think Sam Harris did exactly what you should do in a joint pe press conference. It's the reason why when I agreed to debate at UMBC, I did not for a second want that format. I said from the beginning, I want us to be able to ask each other questions and have a real debate. That information wasn't relayed to Father Jacob, see? Oh, so... He wasn't as big a fan of that format, as I find is the case <laughs> for many others. Of course not. It interrupts his pitch. So the back-and-forth questions were left to a minimum. And what I did in that case was both attempt to address... I basically took the kind of almost the Craig role of I stated my case and I pointed out how his statements didn't, mm -hmm. you know, impact my case at all. But anyway, enough about that. We have another news item. Yeah. 
Um, Do we? the only one here who has any news <laughs> I'm items? I'm afraid so. Well, there's a Ten Commandments display that was rejected in Louisiana. Oh, yeah. What about that? Does that uh, have the wrong Ten Commandments in it? No. Um, the, uh, oh, I'm going it, to, it's probably Rapides <laughs> Parish. Police jury did something right this week. Uh, this is from Friendly Atheist, by the way. When they voted against putting the Ten Commandments in the parish courthouse, the motion failed Monday by a 6-3 to three vote. Um, District Juror Oliver Ali Overton said, I'm comfortable with what we did. Like I said, when I was sworn in, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and Louisiana. I will not make a decision to knowingly violate the law. District Juror Scott Perry said, I Well will- done. I've lived by the Ten Commandments all my life, and I've taught them to my kids. I carry the Ten Commandments in my heart, but if I vote to ratify, I've broken the law. Woohoo! Why didn't you do that in your swamp people voice? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> nobody would understand it. Your what voice? Swamp people. It's a show about alligator hunters oh. in, in Louisiana. Oh, swamp. boy. And uh, they, they have uh, a delectable dialect <laughs> that I imitate and... Just drive her nuts. Um, so, we got an example of some Christians who understand the law and are willing to uphold it. Good for them. Wow. Kudos all day long. However, um, District Juror Jamie Floyd said, When they outlaw having a Bible, are we going to take a stand then? When they outlaw having a gun, are we going to take a stand then? I just... It's Dude. just shocking. Um, they didn't outlaw having the Ten Commandments. They they shot down legislation to plaster a divisive sectarian religious message up in a public area. They didn't outlaw your Bible. They didn't take away your gun. But I love the fact that you leapt right to, Reef. we need to take a stand. Um, they're trying to take our gun. I, you can have your gun. Enjoy your gun. Pretty sure you can't bring your gun into the courthouse either. I'm pretty sure yeah. that even those of you with concealed carry permits, um, which do exist in states like Texas and Louisiana, et cetera, um, still would be in trouble if you walked into the courtroom with that weapon on your person. It's, this isn't, you know, we understand there are places where some things don't belong. And the public courthouse is not a place for a divisive sectarian religious message with the stamped seal of approval of the elected officials wow I'm exaggerating for effect do you mind if i get controversial for a minute <laughs> uh oh knock yourself uh, out i want to talk abortion for a sec oh good because uh, i haven't talked about that enough this week <laughs> um and I think, actually, I can't remember what triggered it. I think it was partly Ray Comfort and partly my blog post that has made us get a number of atheists who are anti-choice. Yeah, Uh, I heard from quite a few of them after the conversation with Ray. Right, writing to us. And I understand we don't speak for all atheists. and some certainly not. Some of them uh, don't agree. But here here in this room, I think we're pretty much all agreed that it's an important legal right that needs to be upheld. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> hell, yeah. Oh, yeah. With all the hesitation. <laughs> Sorry, I turned uh, my mic just, off yeah, so but as hell not yeah. to interrupt you, and then you ask me to chime in. <laughs> Something is going on, which I heard about on uh, Rachel Maddow's podcast, that I hadn't noticed, but I had noticed that we were talking several times in the recent past about states passing sort of draconian anti-abortion laws that seem oh, to kind yeah. of violate Roe versus Wade. Uh, like imposing waiting periods, some of them as short as a month. So basically, as soon as you realize that you've, uh, um, as soon as you realize that you've missed one period, you are now no longer allowed to get an abortion because they're shortening the uh, viability time, or they're declaring fetuses as having rights or stuff right. like that. Were you going to say something? No, I'm just oh, waiting. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. Clutching so, that microphone, ready to the, pounce. These kind of things are in violation of Roe versus Wade, basically. They yeah. are states passing laws that say that uh, they, ha- they are, have the authority to do things that, according to the Supreme Court, they do not have the right to do. I mean, Roe versus Wade basically says that in the first trimester, you've got the right to do it no matter what. 
in the second trimester, it's up to discretion. In the third trimester, it's probably uh, not okay, but there are exceptions. When the states do this, the only way to, to respond to this sort of behavior is to take them up before the Supreme Court and get that law declared unconstitutional. But there's a problem. Because Bush was elected for a second term, uh, coming up on eight years ago. Uh oh. We've now got Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, and as far as anyone knows, they are the swing votes that would actually be able to overturn Roe versus Wade. Right. So, women's groups, uh, I mean, you know, abortion advocacy groups, we're talking. Uh, um, let me see. The National Organization for Women, I believe, is one of those groups that would be expected to bring this case up. But they can't do it right now because if they brought right. an abortion case, then that would give the Supreme Court the opportunity to, to actually outlaw it. Meanwhile, because they know that they can't do it, more and more states are piling on to this and just... <sighs> setting up their own private, unconstitutional, in violation of the Supreme Court, anti-abortion laws uh, in order to either force the issue to be overturned in the Supreme Court or make abortion effectively illegal uh, because the states say that, say that it is. Uh, I wish that people who said there it doesn't matter who you vote for would take note of this case. Right. Yeah, there's a complete war on women and more on uh -huh. Roe v. Wade right now. There's been something like 916 laws passed in just the last couple months. Abortion. I believe it. Yeah, you know, three day waiting periods. Um, having to go to anti choice counseling centers, which is right. unconstitutional, just completely. It's crazy and. There are states, Mississippi has one abortion clinic, South Dakota has one abortion clinic, and they are always just hanging on to that one clinic. You know, South Dakota, there are no abortion doctors in South Dakota. They are all flown in for one day a week. Right. In Wichita, Kansas, where uh, Dr. Uh, Tiller was shot, yeah. uh, they, you know, they're, they haven't had any providers anywhere near them for many years, and now this one doctor is trying to move in, and they're threatening her staff. I mean, like, you know, her secretary. They're saying, we know where you live, because they know that they can't intimidate this doctor, or she wouldn't have gone into abortion practice. And they're, they're going after the underlings, you know, threatening to kill them. Well, they went after her um, landlord and said, yeah. we're going to make this a big nuisance all the time if you don't tell her she can't do abortions at her office. And apparently nobody's capable of doing anything about it. No. Abortion is already wow. pretty much illegal for many women. Yeah. In many states. It kind of goes back to something Dennis and I were talking about before the show, something we've mentioned before, um, and that's this nonsense about Terry Jones, the the pastor who burned the Quran, um, and there are people who are trying to blame him for the deaths that you know were resulted ostensibly from that. No. Um, that's just not the case. Uh, what it is is you have some unreasonable people who are willing to violate the law and threaten anybody uh, who they don't like, don't agree with, um, and intimidate and use terrorist tactics to enforce their opinion in direct violation of the law. Now, in, in the case of the Quran burning uh, and the deaths, I equate that directly with the uh, Danish cartoonists mm -hmm. and the violence that came from that. It doesn't matter if every one of the cartoonists n drew those cartoons knowing that this was a likely outcome. Right. Because what you're doing by prohibiting it or it is a terrorist, re a, a, res a censorship response to terrorism. And what these people are doing is saying, we don't like the law the way it is. And rather than working within the system to do this, we are going to make life 
miserable for anybody who doesn't follow our particular views. We will we we won't really advocate bombing an abortion clinic, but we're not going to denounce the people who do or the people who kill an abortion doctor. Uh, what we're going to do instead is go to their landlords. We're going to go to their secretaries. We're going to make it impossible to do for them to do business because, damn it, this is our place, and if we'll, you don't like it, you can get the hell out. That's right. We'll publish their names and addresses. What we need is um, both elected – we need elected officials that are going to enforce the fucking law and go after all of these domestic terrorists mm-hmm. because that's what they are mm-hmm. who are attempting to enforce their own particular views – on to people in violation of the law that has to happen and it's not hmm. so yeah, now mean, terry jones is doing something else supposedly but right i mean regarding the way the worst thing you can say about terry jones and i'm going to quote the great philosopher arnold schwarzenegger oh, great in the uh, movie last action hero <laughs> His sidekick he's smarter says, than us. He must be guilty of something. Yeah, he's guilty of acting like an asshole. If I arrest him, I have to arrest Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, they're they're now going to like put Muhammad on trial, um, as it did with the Quran. Now, of course, yeah, you know, oh, nice kangaroo court. Yeah, they're, they're kangaroo court. Um, hey, I wonder what the verdict's going to be. Oh, um, um, but you know, this is this is the the church seeking out publicity and and the and the the aspect that i do not uh directly relate it to for example the danish cartoons and the other subjects we talked about is that in this case um you know terry jones is operating within his first amendment rights and he has every right to do it we need to protect his rights just as we would anybody else however he's also just being a douche the cartoonists weren't necessarily being a douche Terry Jones' goal isn't to show that um, Islam has within it an intolerant, violent sector. That's not his goal. His goal is um, I'm I, my 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 God is way better than their God, and these guys are all just um, uh, heathens who are worshiping a false god, and so I'm going to poke fun at them. Um, and he has every right to do that, but he's being a douche by doing it. You know. Yep. Or an asshole, or dick, or whatever. <laughs> the distinction is a subtle one. So, so my favorite headline of the week is one that Beth mm-hmm. caught, and it's f- from WND, uh, <laughs> which is fight escalates over teacher fired for Bible on desk. Now. If that's not the most misleading headline I've ever wow. seen, well, well, is it? what happened? You don't, you don't remember when we talked about that teacher who got fired over a Bible on his desk? Maybe you'll know better as the guy who was branding his students with crosses. <laughs> oh, oh, for okay. Pete's sake. Now, granted, branding is a strong and inaccurate term. He was not you know, using a, wow. a, a uh, branding iron. Right, it was a right. Tesla but coil. he was burning crosses in people's arms. Yeah, it, you know, it, he, oh, he sh- claims it was an X. Hey, that's a good defense. I got fired for having a Bible on my desk. Oh, um, screw you, and to whiny be f- little... To be fair, one of, the, one of the real aspects of his termination was because he refused to remove the religious references from you know his classroom and stuff. So it is kind of accurate, but when you hear that, you're like, wait a minute. Some teacher was fired for not removing a Bible from their desk? Yeah, if that was the case, I'd be all like, you know, you know don't do that. Well, no, <laughs> no it's, you know, it's... I could see where it would be reasonable to fire somebody for failing to follow school standards of right. not bringing your religious material and putting it, displaying it on your desk, because that's not what school's for. But when I read the headline, I was like, "Wow, how come I haven't heard about this?" And then when I found right. out who it was, um, and in this case, uh, we're talking about uh, John Freshwater, uh, is you know the the guy who used the little Tesla coil size right. experiment to. So how does he justify ignoring, forgetting that little bit? About oh, the but he's brain? not. He's not. Oh, this uh, is W and D who wrote so, the headline. So <sighs> World Net Daily actually acknowledges this charge. They say one of the early allegations was that he branded students with a scientific machine called a Tesla, or I think they misspelled Tesla, scientific Tesla machine. coil that demonstrates electrical current. However. He he said that he made only X marks. Yeah, because if he 
burned X mark. I mean, they've even got a picture right there in the article of a burned student's arm, and this, and they're treating it as an alleged allegation. <sighs> what yeah. the hell? World so anyway, world. you know, I mean, when you talk wow. about getting your sources, getting you know, trying to find accurate sources, um, I'll let that stand on its own. Hmm. What else have we got? Uh, well, um, over at Virginia Tech, which seems to be a kind of a breeding ground of crazies. So sorry, no offense to Virginia Tech students. I'm sure most of you are very rational. <laughs> but Virginia Tech police were called to the drill field Wednesday afternoon following a report of a student stabbing his own hand with a pen. <laughs> Um, well, clearly, oh. he had to have a good reason to stab him. So, was there a bug on his hand that he wants trying to get rid of? <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's just very clumsy. Police were called oh. at one nineteen p.m. by a nine one one call from a witness at the scene. Alexander M. Huppert, a freshman university studies major, then assaulted an officer who approached to check his welfare, according to a police press release. Okay. After a short struggle with the officer and several witnesses, he was taken into custody. The yes, incident- I know I just stabbed myself <laughs> with a pen, but don't you come near me or check on my well-being. That doesn't hurt. <laughs> the incident took place near a table promoting the local version of Ask an Atheist Day. The student group Free Thinkers at Virginia Tech sponsored the table. Witnesses said Huppert stood near the table for nearly an hour. Approaching the table, Huppert borrowed a pen and drew a circle with a cross inside on the back of his hand. I haven't read this yet. Oh. <laughs> Nicole Schrand, I can see where it's going, though. Yeah. Nicole Schrand, a senior psychology ma- major, said Huppert then asked students at the table to stab him in the cross with the pen to prove to us God existed. They declined. We don't believe yeah. in assaulting people, said Schrand. We're against us. Assaulting people. Huppert then asked for the pen back. A request Strand and the other students declined. Seeing another pen, Huppert grabbed it and began stabbing himself in the back of the hand. If I'd had if it had been a more streamlined pen, I would have expected it to go through, Strand said. <sighs> oh, <laughs> It reminds me of the Darwin Award, where the guy was like, you know, this glass is so strong that nobody can break through it, see? And he charged right at it. Yeah. So... So, he tried to give himself stigmata? What was he trying to prove there? I think, I mean, maybe he thought that drawing the cross was giving him superpowers? That that no would no he, bounce I, right off him. Somehow? No, I think it was the target for for his. He was trying to give himself stigmata. It looks sounds like. I'm not sure. I think he was trying to. That's I, weird. I yeah, I'm, I don't know. It, see, my guess: you draw a circle on your hand and put a cross in it. The guy could have been delusionally thinking that Jesus would protect him from actually having the pen penetrate if he did wow. that. Wow. Um, or maybe it was, I'm going to take this pain and God's going to heal it right in front of you mm. uh, because my faith is... I don't know what So his prayer gives was. him Wolverine powers. But, but my or thing is... I can is, jam a pen through my hand and not feel it or this something. Is, yeah. This is not in any way Ugh. a problem of Christianity except that this is what... <clears throat> religious ideas due to minds that are unstable right it provides structure of a sort (laughs) so we've seen this before we've seen the gross rationalizations of you know mothers who drown their kids or another story that is up here about a woman who uh circumcised her kid oh man uh at home right Uh, a 29 year old portland mom uh, said she'd been inspired to circumcise her baby after reading the Old Testament nice. uh, and decided to do it home. The bleeding wouldn't stop, so she tried to stitch it up. Uh, oh! After two hours of uncontrolled bleeding, she decided she needed help and called 911 oh. rather than continuing to just pray for the ble- blood to stop. Um, but and this there's, isn't... Oh. There's some disagreement among us about infant circumcision, but we both agree that whatever you think about it, it's a medical procedure. <laughs> At least. You, know, you, you don't give your your infant open heart surgery. Oh. You don't do that shit. Yeah, and I'm sure at some point we'll get back to the disagreement between us. But okay. for today, 
the, the point that I was making is that it's easy to say, hey, look, this, these are these are unstable people. These are, are you know, and they may have done these things uh, through any medium, not just Christianity. And there's nothing particularly, nothing about Christianity that necessarily leads one to take these actions. Um, because, you know, even, even those who do circumcise, you know, they don't do it, tend to do it at home irresponsibly. However, stop and think for a second. If Christianity is true, then there is a God who exists, who purportedly cares about people, and who wants people to know him, love him, follow him, whatever your particular definition is. And down here on this pitiful planet is an individual who, in all sincerity, wants to believe and do what that God wants. And that sincere individual whose beliefs and convictions are so strong then takes a pen and jabs it into his hand. It is ridiculous to claim that Christianity causes this. I agree. This is a result of the individual being unstable. But the one thing that we can point out is that this individual who was unstable was not prevented from taking any action by this religious belief. And if your religious beliefs have this effect on unstable people, then either your God does not care at all about the mentally impaired, or he doesn't fucking exist. And this message, which is rather innocuous to some people, is clearly poisonous to others. And we would be much better off if we treated the mentally in unstable responsibly and with, oh, I don't know, science, rather than myth and superstition. You, you don't get a pass. You don't get to say, well, that person was obviously crazy. You can't blame that on Christianity. You're right. That person was obviously crazy, and I can't blame it on Christianity. But that doesn't mean you get off scot-free, because you're asserting that a God actually exists. You're asserting that the doctrine is true. You're asserting, basically, if your worldview is correct... You have no explanation for why this person was not aided by the God that they clearly, sincerely believe in, or right. why they're mentally fucking deficient in the first place. For what reason does your God allow people to be so mentally deficient that even in their sincerity of wanting to, to know and worship this God, that they come to the wrong conclusions and do harm to themselves and others? You do not, you don't get a pass on that. Your worldview is either true or it's not. And you don't get to go singling out and saying, well, you know, this guy. So not only are iron chariots more powerful than your God, but crazy people are more powerful than your God? Obviously. I'm, I'm more powerful than their God, as was shown on a Facebook conversation the other day where somebody said, well, it's not God's fault you're an atheist. You chose to be an atheist against God's will. Great. I can violate God's will. God, I am yeah. more powerful than your God. You know why? Because he doesn't fucking exist. I, I actually can we grow up yet? Remember when we were talking to Ray Comfort and brought up the story from a previous nonprofits where uh, the woman slit her own kid's throat, believing that the end times were coming. Right, right. And, and Ray said something which was, in a way, kind of fair, which was basically that there are a lot of crazy people out there. And then he says, and they are drawn to the warm embrace of Christianity, as if they were going to do yeah. that crazy stuff anyway before they came to Christianity. But. Uh. The the idea that she ought to slit her kid's throat didn't come to her free of the religious stuff. It may not be um, stuff that the sane people among the religious would think of, but, I mean, it's completely consistent with biblical teaching as far as I can tell. Yeah, there's nothing in the Bible about that I'm aware of about drawing a circle in your hand, putting a cross in it, and stabbing a pen through. No. But there is something right. in the Bible about circumcision. And there is something oh, in yeah. the Bible about the penalty for children who grow up and fall away from God, and so that there is a rational uh, or, or 
uh, internally consistent, consistent reason, reason uh, to prevent that from happening. There is admonition against certain acts um, that would support things like the Salem witch burnings. You don't get to pretend that the Crusades are not consistent with what your Bible actually says. Right. And so that's why you have moderate and liberal Christians now who are saying, as, for example, Father Jacobs, he said when we were debating, um, that I have this fundamentalist viewpoint on it because that's the way I was raised. He's right. I do. Um, he doesn't believe in, in the Bible, uh, the whole Bible, mm -hmm. as accurate. And Ray Comfort admitted on the show that there's lots of things in the Bible that he doesn't like yeah. or consider to be the Word of God. And so now, to me, wow, they that's all got just, their little magic decoder ring. Yeah. Um, yeah, where's my decoder ring? Why, how come? Oh, no, no. Your decoder ring comes when you trust and follow God. Wow. You just really look no, up it, circular. It comes when you, when you put your faith in spag. Self-projection as God. Yeah. It's curious how God never seems to disagree with anybody, including the crazy people, which, you know, right. we can debate as to how, who, who fits the crazy person category. Yeah, it's like... Yo, okay, so he, he disagrees with some of the stuff in the Bible. Does he disagree with some of the things God wants? I, I don't... Does he disagree with no, God? No, he way? won't disagree with God. He'll right. just disagree that there are words in there that are supposedly from so God. So they must not are. be from God, but yeah. they're in the Bible. Okay. Yeah. No, but I mean, like all religious people, Ray Comfort really believes in Ray Comfort. I mean, yeah, you know, that's he it. Self believes that whatever he feels is morally right must be a message direct from God to him or he wouldn't have these feelings. So, let's uh, since we're over the hour mark, um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up with a couple of quickies. Um, the Atlanta Free, Atlanta Free Thought Society uh, has a new building, and it used to be a church. Uh huh. Uh, an idea that's been tossed around as the ACA looks for a building as well. Um, but after 140 years, the building had been sold to developers, fallen into disrepair, and was in danger of being destroyed by vandals. Uh, but the uh, Atlanta Free Thought uh, Society got together and purchased it. And they are. It is now the headquarters. It says Atlanta Free Thought Hall right above the doors that you know cool. used to say. Uh, and they still have the uh, the original wood sign that says Collin Springs Primitive Baptist Church built in 1866. Primitive? Primitive Baptist Church. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> accurate. Yeah. So honest. It's unexpectedly refreshing. And there was one other thing um, that wasn't a news story, but that was positive and, and somewhat up. Oh, I remember what it was. Um, next Sunday is not only the... American AC yeah. National Convention, but um, Easter, which we talked about a little bit at the right. beginning, and because I know there are some Christians out there listening, I you know, um, we've had a caller from named Mark from the Stone Church in here in Austin call in a couple times, and it's been you know g good oh. calls, some mm -hmm. popular feedback, and Sunday he called in while Russell was on, and and Tracy and Tracy. Um, and made some statements, and I was watching the show while I cooked, and said, uh, and I called in real quick to get a message to Russell to say, look, we can't keep letting this individual, who, from my point of view, is clearly um, mildly unstable and not an original thinker. I mean, when you ask him what he believes, uh -huh. he'll tell you. When you ask him why he believes it, not once did he reference anything other than, well, my pastor said, or if you listen to this sermon, you know, those types of things. Right. He, he keeps saying, we believe, like yeah. my church believes. and Yeah. And he mentioned that, you know, our his church would hate us for certain things and that there is a signif significant problem within the church of their youth group uh, or youth in their mm -hmm. church watching our show and uh, looking up to us and this is causing some problems. And I said, you know, we can't keep... I'm happy to talk to Mark about what he believes and why, um, but I can't take his word for what's going on in the church. Uh, so, you know, t tell him that it's we don't need him to keep bringing this stuff up about the youth in the church. Right. I'd rather hear from pastors of the church, uh, parents mm -hmm. of, of youth who have this problem, or some of the youth themselves, whatever, so that I can actually get it from the horse's mouth rather than from one person who is, you know, nice and, and generally pleasant, but obviously terrified 
um, and shaken every time he calls, giving me information. It's it's all hearsay. Um, So I heard from one of the uh, teaching pastors at Stone Church uh, by email. Yeah. um, Who basically, in a nutshell, said that Mark doesn't speak on behalf of the church, which Mark didn't really claim to do, but some of the things he said were along those lines. Um, And that, you know, the church doesn't hate us, that he actually watches the show and thinks we provide a valuable service. Uh, He and I are going to lunch on Tuesday, uh, hopefully. (laughs) It may have to be postponed because we're using one car and she's driving the carpool this week. Um, So it may not happen Tuesday. Um, And then Beth and I are planning on probably going to Stone Stone Church for a service on the 15th because there's no TV show on the 15th. Wow, you're not trying for a Templeton Prize, are you? No, no. Okay, good. But, um, Can I come if I'm free? I don't care. <laughs> Next month? I Sure. Um, I don't want, you know, a flood of atheists to come marching no. in the door and disrupt their service. But, you, you know, I, I, we can't even say for sure that it's going to be the 15th, but it may be. Um, but as, as the Christian listeners um, go about their Easter celebrations... I'd like you to take a second to think about, from within your doctrine, what exactly is it that you're celebrating and commemorating here? Well, set aside the fact that, you know, Easter, right down to the very name, is stolen uh, from other religious traditions. Set aside that this absurd nonsense of rabbits laying eggs and things that <laughs> that have become this secular, let's have fun with this right. and pass out chocolate. I'm talking about from the standpoint of your church and your church's doctrine, what are you actually celebrating? In most Christian denominations, to the extent that they celebrate it at all, Easter is a commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus. We have no good reason to think anything like this has ever occurred, that the stories are accurate. And set all of that aside. What you're really doing is saying, I'm a fan of a God who's willing to torment and torture and crucify an individual, be him, be God or man, whatever. Right. As a to serve as a loophole for the rules that he created, it is a blood cult. You are worshiping the equivalent of a zombie. I don't care if, how offensive you find that, um, but more than that, you're you're not only worshiping and 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 commemorating something that's patently absurd, but also disgusting. You're worshiping a God who created everything and made rules and doesn't seem to find any other way of circumventing these rules. I don't know why you would have to circumvent rules you created. You just changed them. They're supposed to be perfect. You know, I I created a perfect world, perfect rules, um, so there can't be an error in the rules. But now I'm going to if I'm going to make an exception to the rules, um, I would just change the rules. Although that would be an admission that I'm imperfect. So instead, I'm going to create a loophole, which is still an admission that I'm imperfect. And what's the best way for me to create that loophole? I've got it. A blood sacrifice. Because because we're really just descendants of a magic cult that believes life is in the blood. But then again, it's not really a blood sacrifice. Because what did Jesus lose? Well, they, nothing. Yeah, there, there wasn't a sacrifice. Um, uh, you know, I mean, like we said before, you know, when Elvis died for our sins, he yeah. stayed dead. But you like the blood. And by the way, if somebody came to me and said, and, and I knew for certain, as within the theology, Jesus clearly would have known for certain, hey, I'm going to torture you uh, and kill you. And then three days later, you get to go on to rule the universe. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it'd be okay if you can prove, you know, absolutely yeah, yeah. this is you true. You convince me, yeah, sign you need me some up. Pretty solid yeah. evidence for that one. But I mean, you know, clearly, if if it was true, um, then Jesus was aware of the truth of this. Uh, not really a sacrifice. No, I, I guess he sacrificed three, two days and a yeah, night, yeah. you know, or, or so. Um, but yeah. it it's not just absurd; <sighs> it's immoral. Yeah, it is. It doesn't make any sense. 
And when you think about that and when you ask about it or when you try to shrug it off as, well, I realize this doesn't make sense to you, but that's because you're not looking at it through the eyes guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, oh. Think about what you're actually saying that to an a regular rational mind, this doesn't make sense, but it only makes sense if you already presuppose the conditions um, of right. this religion. And then once you're all done and you've come up with whatever rationalization it is that allows you to continue to not only believe this, but uh, to laud it as something yeah. valuable. Um, think about, think about the people who don't do that and take a second to at least try to see why we not only think that you are demonstrating a severe lack of critical thinking skills, but that your brain has been so polluted by a dogma that you have taken something which by any other standard would be considered immoral and are now holding up as the greatest moral event in history. It is the ultimate sacrifice that wasn't a sacrifice. It was the ultimate demonstration of love, which has absolutely no recognizable corollary to what we think of as love. How duped do you have to be? How poisoned does your brain have to be before you can twist evil into good, non-sacrifice into sacrifice, absurdity into rationality, And if you've rationalized on this, well, God understands it and I don't, then you're admitting that you don't care to think for yourself, that you're believing it on terrible grounds, and that should be all any of you need to chuck this nonsense aside. And on that, happy Easter. (laughs) Yeah. Happy Easter, everyone. (laughs) Charlie Brown. (laughs) Right. And I leave you with the true spirit of Easter. Uh, Dennis Lube. <laughs> so what? You don't believe in magical fairies? Well, that's too bad, because I'm Dennis Lube, along with Matt Dillahunty, yeah. Russell Glasser, Chirp. and Beth Presswood. Bye. And we'll be back in a week with another episode, once it's made law that you'll have to believe in fairies. And you'll have to like Peter Cottontail, or be exiled from our magical kingdom. So there. Fairies chirp, right? And actually, we won't be back in one week because oh, I'll be out of town do, for the do, convention. Do, do, do. I completely ruined your exit. You ruined my exit. Two weeks. Here's the music. Two everything weeks. else he says is true. He's the king of Rabbit Town. Look at Peter Cottontail. Hopping down the bunny trail. Trippity hopping on his merry way. Peter Cotton, Cottontail. He's the king of bunny land. Cause his eyes are shiny and he can spot the wolf a mile away.